Another week of waiting for stimulus, for Brexit, and for COVID to peak. Welcome to Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. This week, special contributor Larry Summers of Harvard. The process coveted shares of IPOs popping by $70 a share, that's a travesty. SEC Chairman Jay Clayton. The culture of investing for the long term is something that we need to foster uh, across our regulatory uh, infrastructure. Former House Majority Leader Eric Cantor. Catherine Baker of the University of Chicago. The more different vaccines are introduced, the more complex the distribution is. Syrah Malik of Nuveen and Neil Ferguson of the Hoover Institution. If we were looking for the cavalry to ride in and save us all, this was not our week. They keep teasing us with a stimulus package in the United States. We cannot leave here without having a piece of legislation. But it wasn't to be, at least not yet. And yet another drop-dead date came and went for a Brexit agreement, with Prime Minister Johnson saying he couldn't possibly agree to what's been offered. I don't believe, Mr. Speaker, that those are terms that any Prime Minister of this country uh, should accept. But agreed to keep talking through the weekend. And most of all, we didn't see any sign that COVID was peaking, with deaths in the United States reaching toward 300,000 and climbing at a rate of 3,000 every day, even as the Pfizer vaccine gained approval and vaccinations began. And how did Wall Street react to all this waiting? Well, it lost a little bit of its moxie this week. The S&P and the Nasdaq gave up a percent or so, while the Russell Small Cap Index kept rising. Bonds were a bit more attractive, with the 10-year yield pulling back from that 1% mark. But we can't give up yet, at least on the reflation trade, with the Bloomberg Commodity Spot Index higher than it's been since 2014, and the 10-year inflation outlook nudging back up as well. To interpret this all for us and give us some advice on what investors should do about it, we welcome back now Sarah Malik. She is Nuveen Chief Investment Officer for Global Equities. Always great to have you, Sarah. So give us a sense, where should we put our money given all this indecision, all this waiting for things that aren't quite happening yet? Well, we're definitely going to see some short-term economic turbulence with these cases rising and the lack of stimulus, but we're optimistic on 2021 because the vaccine is right around the corner. We should get stimulus in the first quarter. And the key for the markets to continue to work in 2021 is going to be passing that baton from valuation-driven markets to earnings-driven markets. We do think that stimulus, the consumer coming back to normal, and also operating leverage for companies that have been cutting costs through the pandemic are going to drive S&P 500 earnings faster than people expect. So that leads us to liking areas such as small caps. Outside of the U.S., we like emerging markets. So if we're going to get back to earnings and away from valuations, as you just said, does that also mean we're going to get a little bit away from the growth and more into the value? Some people are talking about that rotation as well. Yeah, we see more of a stock picker, picker's market, so less correlations between companies. So this isn't going to be all about just own the FANG stocks like you could have done for the last decade. However, we, we do still think technology stocks have those margins and strong free cash flow to continue to work. But value stocks are interesting. Look at financials where there's upside to earnings. We see yields going up a little bit on the 10 year. That's positive for financials and they're very cheap. And small caps also, they have that operating leverage to a fast growing economy. And also as interest rates start to slowly increase, it's good for small caps. So these are areas where we think you can broaden out and now just not worry about owning just five stocks in the FANG space, but a lot more than that. Sarah, what about the so-called reflation trade? Do you buy it? Moderately. So some reflation is good for the for the economy and stock market. Too much inflation could lead to overheating. We think there will be some inflation as we go back to normal, but there's a lot of headwinds still for inflation, including productivity, offshore manufacturing. That's going to keep the lid on pricing. And the most important aspect is wage inflation. And we're not seeing that yet because the employment market is not tight. So without wage inflation, we're not worried about too much inflation causing the economy to overheat. So, Sarah, you're saying that you really focused, uh, going into 2021 on earnings more than valuation, but some of that valuation has come surely from the fact that we have essentially zero interest rates. We've got the Fed meeting next week. Is anything the Fed going to say or do going to affect equities? 
We doubt it. We think the Fed will stay on message, which will be very accommodative, accommodative, do what's necessary to get us to where we're back to more of a normal economy. And, and that should be good news. But valuations are getting pretty full, and we do need that earnings growth to kick in across the board and, and drive us to strong returns in 2021. And, and as I mentioned earlier, there's a very good si chance of that. Our forecast is that earnings consensus actually for the S&P 500 is probably too low. If you look at 2021 earnings pre the pandemic, the S&P was set to earn 194 in 2021. We're at about 170 for next year, and we see upside to that 170. So you said you think it's a stock picker's market we're coming into here. You can't just ride the beta up. Where do you look for alpha? How do you sort of find it? Well, for example, we talked about financials. So look for quality companies like Bank of America, which actually was a conservative lender throughout this crisis. We also talked about non-U.S. markets. You get more bang for your buck from emerging markets in areas such as Mexico and Brazil, which really need the vaccine for them to come back to normal. And there's great companies over there like Arcos Dorados, which trades in the U.S. This is the golden arches of Latin America. It's the largest McDonald's franchisee, great brand name, also leveraged to the consumer. And then we like areas such as China and Thailand, airports of Thailand, very leveraged to tourism. And we, when we all start traveling again, I think Thailand's going to be a top choice for a destination. So follow up on that for a second. You mentioned Latin America, but then Asia. Asia seems to have done a bit better in dealing with COVID-19. Is that particular place we should be looking for investment? China is the biggest piece of the emerging markets benchmark. And while it's done well and grown quite well, it has a lot of liquidity and stimulus still in place. And we actually think China does not look expensive yet. So Chinese companies, China A share companies, we particularly like Macau gaming stock. All of those to us still look attractive. It's not an expensive region, even though it's deservedly done well in 2020. Does that get us into politics at all as we see the Trump administration on the way out really trying to take a ding at China companies listed over here? I think that with the administration change, it actually becomes easier for some of these emerging market countries, such as China and Mexico. And that's part of our thesis for why we like those two regions in 2021. Okay, Sarah, it's always such a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you so much. That is Sarah Malik of Nuveen. Coming up, Neil Ferguson of the Hoover Institution on Europe getting ready for even harder times ahead with more monetary stimulus out of the ECB and an historic $2.2 trillion budget and fiscal stimulus plan. That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. The European economy this week got some much needed support, first from the ECB when it expanded and extended its bond buying program, and then from European leaders who agreed to an historic $2.2 trillion budget and stimulus package, complete with jointly issued debt to take us through what this may mean for the European economy and for the future of the alliance. We welcome now Neil Ferguson. He's Hoover Institution's senior fellow and the author of so many books, but one of them, one of my favorite, is The Ascent of Money. Welcome back, Neil. Great to have you with us. So uh, it looked like Europe sort of rose up as one this week and said, we're really going to do some things together and make a difference on the economy. Is that reading too much into it? Well, no, I don't think it is, David. Compared with uh, Europe's performance after the global financial crisis struck, things are going a lot better. Because if you think back uh, to the period after 2009, uh, actually things went terribly badly wrong. Uh, the European Central Bank initially felt uh, quite wrongly that it should tighten policy. And then there was a, a, a kind of cascade of, of debt crises. Uh, which led to all kinds of economic pain, particularly in the south of Europe, uh, most severely uh, in the case of Greece. This time around, it's a different story. After an initial tiny wobble over the uh, arcane question of Italian spreads, Christine Lagarde has been an assured uh, president of the European Central Bank. And most importantly, uh, this uh, next generation EU fiscal package has, uh, in marked contrast to what happened uh, back after the financial crisis, uh, raised a substantial amount of money to distribute to those uh, member states that are struggling with uh, COVID-19. And it's been financed partly out of so-called euro bonds. So yeah, this is definitely progress. 
if you are one of those people who thinks that the European Union should be more like a federation uh, and should do things like issuing its own debt uh, and doing large-scale uh, fiscal transfers between member states. Of course, if you're a Eurosceptic, this just proves uh, that Europe is turning into a super state. Uh, I would add one other thing, David. Those people who think this is the Hamilton moment after Alexander Hamilton, the first Treasury Secretary, are exaggerating. This is not a complete transformation of European finances. The old problem of Italian debt, of the debt of the individual member states, hasn't been solved and will come back at some point to haunt us. So I want to come back to the larger question about where Europe is heading, but how did we get here? I mean, the sort of the narrative is, maybe even the meme, if I'm using that term right, is that Angela Merkel once again wrote in and got this thing done, maybe as her swan song as the leader of Europe. Is that a fair interpretation of what happened? I don't think that's quite right. I mean, Western media, particularly English language media, tend to exaggerate the power of Angela Merkel. Certainly, she has been the dominant figure of German politics for so long that one can hardly remember who was chancellor before her. Uh, but in reality, these things only happen uh, if there is a real consensus that extends not only to the obvious other big countries, uh, like France uh, and Italy, but to some of those smaller countries that still punch uh, above their weight, like the Netherlands. It's pretty hard to do anything of this sort if you can't get the Dutch Prime Minister Mark Rutte on board. So I think it's really more that uh, Merkel, in partnership with the French uh, President Emmanuel Macron, was able to put together uh, a coalition of the willing to get the votes and, and ultimately even to overcome the opposition of those recalcitrant populists in Poland and Hungary who didn't like the sound of the strings that were being attached uh, to this package with respect to rule of law uh, in their countries. Macron is in many ways as important as Merkel these days. And I'll give you one example of that. Early in the pandemic, when things were getting really bad in Europe, Macron said, if we can't do something about this, if we can't pull together and uh, engage in some kind of joint fiscal effort, uh, then really the populists will win and implicitly Europe will fall apart. That was much stronger language than anything that Angela Merkel said. And I do think that Macron is increasingly the driving force uh, that, that will become even more uh, dominant in European politics when Merkel finally leaves the political stage next year, as she has pledged to do. Neil, you mentioned that pesky little issue with Poland and Hungary, where there was some sort of non-binding side letter that got it done. I wonder if that was a, victor, a victory of diplomacy or maybe a hostage of fortune, because there seems to be a fundamental disagreement on things like rule of law, and it seems like they've sort of put that off to the side. Is that possibly some division out there extant with respect to Europe, and particularly with the United Kingdom about to leave? Well, I don't think one should overdo this. Um, I mean, in truth, there was a certain amount of domestic politics uh, involved, particularly with respect to Poland and its uh, a, a coalition government. But in reality, the amounts of money coming to Hungary and Poland under this, uh, this deal were so large uh, that it seemed highly unlikely that they would have the leverage uh, to veto and, indeed, uh, they did not. But you've raised the much bigger question of Brexit, uh, because the UK uh, is is leaving. Uh, there's going to be a lot of brinkmanship between now and the end of the year to decide the exact terms of the divorce, which still have not been uh, finalised. And I think that's a much more significant change, uh, because with Britain's departure, the, the basic political geometry of the European Union changes. For years, Britain after it joined in the 1970s, said, we're in this uh, for an economic common market, but we don't want a federal uh, United States of Europe. Uh, and ultimately, the more it looked as if that was the direction of travel for Europe, the more likely it became that Britain would leave. Well, with Britain gone, there's no real obstacle to further integration, particularly of, of the fiscal side. Remember, Europe has a monetary union. It doesn't include all the member states, but it includes most of them. Uh, and it, it is moving in the direction of having some more integrated fiscal policy. And the Brits aren't there really to drag their feet and slow that process process down anymore. But as I mentioned, uh, there are going to be nail-biting days uh, between now and the end 
the year as we uh, see a wonderful combination, uh, the combination of Boris Johnson's love of brinkmanship, uh, which goes back all the way to his days at Oxford when I first knew him, and the European Union's love of kicking the can down the road uh, for <laughs> as long as possible and as late into the night as possible. So I think ultimately they will reach a deal on these uh, arcane questions of fisheries and level playing fields that all European journalists have to talk about, but it'll be at the very last minute. And as I said, there'll be a lot of nail biting between now and then. Yeah, exactly. And as you suggest, people like Boris Johnson might enjoy some of that attention that comes with the nail biting. I mean, you know him better than I do, but it does strike me that he sort of likes being in the spotlight, perhaps a little bit like President Trump has enjoyed it. Many thanks. We really appreciate Neil Ferguson. Whenever he's with us, he is of the Hoover Institution. Coming up, former House Majority Leader Eric Cantor on how prospects of a recovery are affecting his business at Mollis & Company. They reduce costs of capital um, that's fueling the fact that money's got to go somewhere and there's plenty of potential, I think, that people see beyond just this pandemic. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. Those who thought that if anything so horrible as the election of a Democrat should occur, the bond market would panic and gold would soar, turned out to be suffering from just another superstition. That was Louis Ruckheiser on Wall Street Week back in 1992, just after Bill Clinton was elected president. Now we have a different Democrat elected to the presidency in a very different time. But once again, reports of possible adverse effects on business or the markets appear to have been greatly exaggerated. As reported by a Republican, former House Majority Leader Eric Cantor, now Vice Chairman of Molis and Company. There's no question that we've sort of continued the trend which you and I spoke about in midsummer. I mean, we have seen a dramatic resurgence of uh, M&A globally. Uh, and it's been across sectors. Uh, it is, uh, in, in our view, and it's been dominated by what we're calling the power middle. You know, these are the mid-market companies, the seven, eight hundred million dollars to four or five billion dollar companies. Uh, things are just very active. Obviously, there's a lot of activity uh, amongst the sponsors, the private equity community, and, and really the breadth of participation has been, as you suggest, beyond just the COVID winners. Uh, beyond just the digital and the tech arena. We're seeing it in the chemical arena. We're seeing it in the energy utility arena. We're seeing it in TMT. Uh, so it is broad participation. And I think the striking thing about what we're seeing is the timing um, has been a huge factor in terms of the process. And we, what we're seeing is deals get to exclusivity uh, a lot faster than what was otherwise the case. A lot of it is sort of brought about by the digital infusion of communications and the way people are interacting right now. And I also think you can attribute some of the resurgence back to the cost of capital. And the cost of capital is extremely low. We saw the Federal Reserve step in immediately after the pandemic really hit. Um, that's con that effect has continued to benefit, I think, some of this activity. We are seeing a shift to uh, from stock back to cash uh, because of this and many of the deals that we're involved with. And, and on the upside for investors and, and certainly for our clients, um, what we're seeing is valuations continue to go up. And valuations that we're seeing are even exceeding those from pre-COVID level. So all of this is sort of, uh, it's, it's very interesting given the fact that we are in this unprecedented 100 year pandemic. And I, I, don't, I don't say this lightly, but I do think that for many, um, times seem to be very promising as people are looking beyond the pandemic. But there is a reality here that there are many small businesses that are really suffering. And I do think that the sort of uh, aftermath of all this may be um, continued sort of collapse in certain sectors uh, and the ability to go and restructure to try and allow folks to get back on their feet. Do you see any frothiness? I mean, as you say, the cost of capital is approaching zero as a practical matter. That's really great if you own an asset, if you want to buy an asset. Or is there any sticker shock? There, there's no question. The valuations, and, and when I speak to my partners at Mollis and Company who've been uh, in the markets a lot longer than I have and uh, in these sectors that are surging, 
Um, you know, they do say, look, things are definitely very competitive in these deals out there. I think a lot of that has to do with the supply of capital, the, the reduced cost of capital um, that's fueling the fact that money's got to go somewhere. And there's plenty of potential, I think, that people see beyond just this pandemic. You indicated earlier uh, in the economy the fact that vaccines, uh, you know, are here, and uh, I do think that light is going to be at the end of the tunnel. Let's hope that we can minimize the actual human casualty and focus on the fact that we can see an economy growing again. And hopefully, the policymakers in Washington will be able to wrestle with this notion of getting some of those who have been laid off from work back into the workforce. And I do think that that's going to be a big challenge given the transformation. Uh, that this pandemic has brought about economically. And finally, Eric, are you picking up on any concern in the C-suite about what might happen with regulation or with taxation in a Biden administration? With David, I think that's spot on. And a lot of our conversations with our client have to do with the fact of what to expect in this next Congress. Uh, clearly, there's been a sigh of relief on the taxation issue. Again, assuming the Republicans maintain control of the Senate, uh, we'll see, I think, for the rest of the two years, no significant changes in taxes when most people would expect them to go up. But there will be some regulatory actions undertaken by the Biden administration immediately, uh, very analogous to those moves made by the Trump administration in 17, the Obama administration in 09, which basically will undo the prior administration's regulations. And we'll see a real shift leftward in terms of things like the environment, the labor laws, financial institution oversight, uh, and the rest. That was Eric Cantor, vice chairman of Molis & Company. Now for a look at the week ahead on Global Wall Street. Thanks, David. Here in Asia, we'll be looking for an announcement on banks that do business with individuals hit by U.S. sanctions relating to China's crackdown on Hong Kong. Elsewhere, China's activity indicators will likely show the recovery remained on a strong footing in November. Other than that, it's all about monetary policy. Four Asian central banks announced their final policy decisions of the year, all within a 48-hour period following the Fed's decision. The Bank of Japan is the headliner, and Governor Kuroda & Co. will have additional food for thought thanks to the Tankan Business Survey released earlier in the week and inflation released the morning of their meeting. Danny. Thanks, Julia. The week really will be dominated by Brexit news with a new self-imposed deadline of Sunday. Will a trade deal be reached? Will talks be extended? Or are the parties going to have to come up with contingency plans? The EU is also set to unveil new legislature against tech companies, which could impact American firms like Facebook and Google. Also, we have a lot of central bank decisions, including the BOE on Thursday. Romaine? Thank you, Danny. Here in the U.S., the last policy meeting for the Federal Reserve of the year. No change in benchmark rates are expected. However, bond traders are looking for a little more clarity on those Treasury purchases that the Fed had been making. On the biotech front, investors there are keeping an eye on Pfizer. U.S. health officials expected to begin rolling out the first vaccines as soon as next week. Separately, FDA advisors are set to determine an emergency declaration for a separate vaccine from Moderna. That recommendation could come as soon as Thursday. And that epic rollout that we've seen of U.S. IPOs this year, not over yet. Next week, Context Logic, that's the billion dollar parent company of online retailer Wish, set to debut on the public markets as soon as Wednesday, coming on the heels of those mega IPOs this week from DoorDash and Airbnb. Thanks to Juliet, Danny, and Romaine. Coming up, getting the entire country vaccinated while the healthcare system is struggling to care for the large and growing number of people who already have COVID-19. Catherine Baker of the University of Chicago says it's a task of mythic proportions. It would be a Herculean task under any circumstances. This is the same healthcare system that's going to have to be caring for lots and lots of people who still get COVID. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. won't be the end of our efforts. President-elect Biden this week promised to change the course of the pandemic within his first 100 days in office, part of his aggressive plan to address the number one challenge he faces. Masking, vaccinations, opening schools. These are the three key goals for my first 
100 days. But we'll still have much to do in the year ahead, and sadly, much difficulty as well. President-elect Biden's plan includes a pledge of 100 million vaccine doses in his first 100 days, enough to give 50 million people the two doses they need by April. President Trump's Operation Warp Speed has even higher goals, giving 100 million people the 200 million doses required by the end of February. To help him scale the mountain before him, President-elect Biden named his health care team this week, headed by California Attorney General and former Congressman Javier Becerra of California. That's his choice to be the Secretary of Health and Human Services. It is our turn to build a nation where, as the President-elect so often says, health care is a right not a privilege. If confirmed, Becerra's priorities would extend beyond the coronavirus crisis to expanding the Affordable Care Act. On the campaign trail, candidate Joe Biden called for adding a public option to fill gaps left by Medicare coverage. Everyone should have the right to have affordable health care, and I am very proud of my plan. The government's top infectious disease expert, Dr. Anthony Fauci, will keep the role he's served in under seven presidents going back to Ronald Reagan. But now he'll also be Mr. Biden's chief medical advisor on the coronavirus. These actions are bold, but they are doable and essential to help the public avoid unnecessary risks, to help us save lives, reopen schools and businesses, and to eventually beat the pandemic. President-elect Biden picked Marcella Nunez-Smith for the new position of COVID-19 Equity Task Force Chair, continuing his focus on bridging the gap for minority and underprivileged communities that are among the hardest hit by the pandemic. According to the CDC, the likelihood of dying from COVID-19 is nearly three times higher for Black and Hispanic Americans than for others. We cannot get this pandemic under control if we do not address head-on the issues of inequity in our country. There is no other way. Getting a vaccine that works in so short a time may be nothing short of a miracle. But now that we're on the cusp of getting it, Catherine Baker, Dean of the Harris School of Public Policy at the University of Chicago, says we made in another miracle to get it distributed to those who need it. It would be a Herculean task under any circumstances, but I think it's made all the more challenging by the fact that this is the same healthcare system that's going to have to be caring for lots and lots of people who still get COVID. We're gonna need to do all that we can to suppress uh, transmission of the disease during this period, and also to introduce new therapeutics. It's going to be months and months and months before everyone is vaccinated. And in that time, unfortunately, hundreds of thousands of people are going to be getting COVID. At this point, 200,000 a day. As a practical matter, how many vaccines are we going to need? Not in terms of doses, but how many different suppliers of vaccine? Because one is not going to be enough, is it? One is unlikely to be enough, given how long it takes to manufacture and how many millions and millions of people need to be vaccinated. But of course, the more different vaccines are introduced, the more complex the distribution is because they may have different dosing requirements, different storage requirements, different distribution systems. So ideally, we get as many doses of each vaccine as we can to minimize complexity and maximize distribution. I also wonder whether, as happened last spring, frankly, some of the people who are most vulnerable, the most hit, are the people with the least resources to deal with it. We're talking about low-income people. We're talking about minority groups, particularly in urban centers, but also, for that matter, Native Americans. We've had disproportionate problems. These people didn't have that great a health care system supporting them to begin with, did they? This is compounding all sorts of disparities in our system. Of course, in healthcare, where the people with the most health vulnerabilities, such as diabetes, high blood pressure, they're the most likely to get COVID and the least likely to have access to the healthcare resources. But that's only part of it. There are also the economic disparities that line up as well. People who are least likely to be able to do their jobs from their homes are also, and, and thus more likely to be exposed to the disease, are also the ones with the biggest disease burden. And then the fewest economic resources to weather a recession that's been generated by the pandemic. So people who are losing their jobs, maybe losing their health insurance, this is all exacerbating disparities that line up for the most vulnerable population. They may also be the people least likely to take a vaccine. There is some longstanding distrust of the healthcare system that has been 
uh, well justified by past inequities that I think will make people differentially likely to take up a vaccine that's offered. Go forward to the time that we have wide vaccinations and we're past all the social distancing. Look back and say, what would we have changed or learned to change about the healthcare system because of this crisis? So I think that we have perhaps learned that there is an even bigger return to harmonizing the way that people get insurance and the way they get care, to make it less likely that you lose your insurance when you lose your job, to make sure there are fewer people who fall between the cracks. That's really important for long-term health and maybe there will be more momentum for ensuring a more robust insurance safety net. Well, I wonder about exactly that. We spent a good part of the last four years debating whether we should have the Affordable Care Act at all. It did not get everybody insured. There's some, still something like 26 million people uninsured, but it took down that number rather substantially. Now, what are the prospects, do you think, that we can, because of this COVID-19 crisis, turn that back around and address those holes left behind by the Affordable Care Act? Well, there's still some states that haven't expanded their Medicaid programs, and they may be more likely to do so in the coming years. Also, I think there are ways that we can make sure that people get to keep their insurance when they transition from a, one job to another or when their income goes up and down around that Medicaid eligibility threshold. Having more continuous coverage could be achieved by harmonizing the state insurance marketplaces and Medicaid programs. Also making sure that people have options for insurance that don't depend on their jobs. That was one particularly salient consequence of our system during the pandemic was that people were losing their jobs at a time when they needed health insurance and health care the most. So having a system that doesn't tie your insurance to your job might be helpful in those circumstances. Thanks to Dean Catherine Baker of the Harris School of Public Policy at the University of Chicago. Coming up, SEC Chairman Jay Clayton on what he's accomplished during his tenure and what is left to be done. We need vibrant private markets up through and well above that $200 million level. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. Jay Clayton is nearing the end of his four years as chairman of the SEC, leaving behind a record number of new regulations and over $14 billion in monetary remedies. One of his goals was to reinforce the attractiveness of the public markets in raising capital. So it's only fitting that even as he counts down the days until his departure, he saw this week the remarkable IPOs of DoorDash and then Airbnb something we asked him about even as they were happening. It's a question not just for the SEC, but, but across our economy. Um, look, markets thirst for information. They thirst for information by the microsecond. So markets are always going to be focusing on short-term changes. The culture of investing for the long-term is something that we need to foster uh, across our regulatory uh, infrastructure. The SEC is is here to help with the way that we try to talk about trends, uncertainties, opportunities, getting companies to disclose that kind of forward-looking information. I think disclosure of that type of forward-looking information helps foster a long-term attitude. But David, one thing I've learned in Washington is that is that this needs to be sort of a whole of government approach uh, to more long-termism. Uh, for a foreign investor. Give us a sense of what this really flurry of IPOs, largely in the tech, the growth, the startup space, what they're telling us about our markets here as we approach the end of the year. Well, well look, David, we, we have focused on uh, increasing the attractiveness of our public capital markets for medium-sized companies and companies, you know, before they get to be astronomically large. And, and why? Because in our public markets, retail investors and professional investors sit side by side. And if you're investing over the long term, like we talked about, being able to sit side by side with the professionals is, is such an advantage. Now, you know, whether a, a market is relatively attractive in one month or one quarter or one year, um, as opposed to another, that's not something that we can focus on at the SEC. We sort of have to do these things for the long term. But I am heartened to see that over the last, you know, two, three, four years, our public markets do seem to be becoming more attractive sooner in a company's life cycle. 
Are you concerned at all about the growth of private uh, private capital as opposed to public capital? Because there's an awful lot that's being done on the private side now that used to be done in publicly. Well, let me say this. People talk about that as a dichotomy. It's not a dichotomy. If you're a company that's, say, under, pick a number, David, 100 million, 200 million, the private markets are really your only viable source of, of growth capital. So we need to preserve that private market and foster that private market. It is part of the dynamism of America. It's part of innovation. Then you get above that $200 million valuation level, you get it up into the types of companies that you were just talking about. There, you do want to encourage those companies to become public companies for the reasons we talked about, greater participation um, from the American retail investor. And, and that's how I look at it, David. But we need vibrant private markets up through and well above that $200 million level. It, it so contributes to the nimble nature of American capitalism. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to save the toughest one for last, I suspect, and that's money market re mm -hmm. fund reform, because we've heard a lot about short-term funding. We, we, there's been various attempts to try to address it. We had it as a crisis, really, I think it's fair to say, this spring again, where the Fed had to step in. We don't seem to have our arms, arms around it. I talked with Dan Trill, a former Fed uh, member recently, and he said he thinks it's up to the SEC in the next round to do that. What could be done on the short-term funding front? Well, th you know, you... As usual, you um, you frame this in in the right way, which is, you know, the short-term funding markets and the money markets are inextricably linked. The short-term funding markets um, are different depending on the underlying instrument. So our our treasury market and there are money market treasury funds is far different from the short-term um, municipal paper market, which also has money money market funds. And what we need to do, David is we need to recognize those differences across short-term funding, you know, treasuries, agencies, commercial paper, uh, muni paper, and that to put together a, a near cash product or a cash type product in each one of those sectors is quite a different thing. So I expect that reforms will reflect those differences. I expect reforms will be coming. I also expect that those reforms um, will not only be um, the result of domestic consultation, uh, led by the SEC, the Fed, and the others, but also international consultation. Because what we did find out, again, uh, in the spring of this year, is that short-term funding markets are interconnected, not just domestically, but internationally. That was Jay Clayton, chairman of the SEC. Coming up, we wrap up the week, as we always do, with our special contributor, Larry Summers of Harvard. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is Wall Street Week, I'm David Weston. We're gonna wrap up the week as we do every week with our special contributor, Larry Summers of Harvard. So Larry, maybe the biggest story on Wall Street this week were these IPOs. We had DoorDash first, then we have Airbnb come out. Airbnb ends up with a market cap of like $100 billion, just astronomical numbers. What is that telling us about our economy as well as our financial system? Look, uh, the fact that we're creating these very valuable, terrific companies says something very special about American capitalism, and that's a strength. The process, coveted shares of IPOs, popping by $70 a share, people getting rich very quick, flipping uh, the stock, uh, that's a travesty. That's why people don't like the morality of our financial services industry, and this kind of Gilded Age stuff in the midst of COVID, when children in our country are going hungry, when mothers aren't able to take care of their kids and support uh, their families, this is a symptom of terrible excess. So, so you make a really powerful point. I mean, there's a moral point to be sure, but is there also an economic point? Because even as we're watching Congress take us up to something of a fiscal cliff here, with millions of Americans potentially losing unemployment and other benefits, if they can't get their act together, you have those people who are worried about putting food on the table, a roof on their heads, and then you have this enormous wealth being created. You referred to the Gilded Age. What does that do to our economic growth engine? Sure there is, David. I, I have enormous uh, respect for uh, Hank Paulson, and I think he served the country in really great uh, ways.
But when on the very day this was happening, he called for making strengthening America's financial services sector some kind of major priority. And he implicitly advocated cutting back people's social security benefits in the name of fiscal discipline and calling for uh, entitlement uh, uh, controls and the rhetoric of long-term fiscal discipline. I thought to myself, uh, there I cannot uh, go. That what we are witnessing is a kind of financial sector hypertrophy that I think is very dangerous and that really demands a lot of soul searching. Um, again, I have all four venture capital, I have all four of the entrepreneurial companies, but selling something for $70 and enabling people to flip it at $140. That, I think, is appalling. How much of this is a result of the Federal Reserve as a practical matter? Because there's so much liquidity in the marketplace. I mean, certainly that's sustaining an awful lot of these valuations. There are questions you can ask about the long-term valuations, but the fact that the stock was sold at $68 and then immediately jumped to $140, making those who were lucky enough to get access billions of dollars, that error has nothing to do with liquidity. That has to do with the way our Wall Street is organized. And that ought to be a priority for somebody to clean up. Uh, Larry, you referred to the Gilded Age. One of the phenomena of the Gilded Age, as I recall, is there was no income tax. In fact, they had to amend the Constitution, I think, in order to have an income tax. We have an income tax now, but you actually have written about, and now you've tweeted about the fact that we don't collect the taxes that we're owed. Seven trillion dollars that is owed won't be collected over the next decade. It'll be disproportionately among people at the high end. And I have to say it's a warped set of social values that lead us to audit at higher rates in African-American areas of Mississippi where people get the EITC than in the richest zip codes on uh, Park Avenue. The idea that you're more likely to get audited if you're collecting the earned income uh, tax credit than if you're collecting uh, carried interest has something uh, very badly wrong with it. Well, in the piece that you wrote with Mr. Asadi uh, actually pointed out that it would be a smart investment for a relatively modest increase in the, in the resources available to the IRS we would get something like tenfold. We're gonna bring ten. This is this is this is easy. If you have one more auditing hour directed at high income people, that will raise four thousand five hundred dollars, according to the IRS's estimates, without taking account of uh, the deterrence uh, effects. And I can sh assure you that no IRS agent is paid anything like. $4,500 an hour. Frankly, they're not paid anything like $450 um, an hour. So this is a terrific investment. It is standing up for the law, the rule of law. And I hope some of the voices in our country that are concerned with getting tough on crime could think about these crimes among others. Why haven't we done it already? Is this, is this political? I mean, you were Secretary of Treasury and then you were in the Obama White House. Was this a problem then or is this a reasonably recent phenomenon? Part of it is a myopia on the part of the way we calculate budgets, where you don't get any credit for the re revenue benefit from the investment. And so it looks just like a cost, even though it's a major revenue item. It's like trying to run McDonald's and not giving yourself any credit for revenue from selling uh, milkshakes. Well, it'll cause you to stop selling milkshakes, but it doesn't really make uh, any sense. It's that kind of scorekeeping error. And um, let's be honest, uh, there's some people who don't want the tax law enforced mm -hmm. because they don't want to pay what they owe and they don't want to face the possibility of being audited. And we've got too many Congress people who see their job as working 
for those scoff laws. So let's wrap it up with a rapid fire round. As Summer says, and let's start off. We're beginning to see the economic team around President-elect Biden. You know these people. Pick one that will turn out to be a real star. It's a great team across the board. I think my uh, old colleague uh, Brian Deese is going to be much better known a year from now than he is today, and that he's going to be a driving force behind much more effective and much more green economic policies in our country. Okay, Brian Deese, we'll keep our eyes on him. Uh, okay, give us a n number now. For U.S. GDP growth in 2021, what do you think? What's the percentage growth we'll have? Because right now economists are saying, so if it's going to be a rough first half of the year, then we'll come back in all likelihood because of the vaccine. I think between the vaccine and between the fact that there's a lot of pent-up savings from the money people couldn't spend, I'm an optimist. I think we're going to have a good year in the 5% range. Oh, good. That's that is good news. OK, and bring it back to New York City uh, right here where we are right now. Uh, when will be the date that the New York City economy returns to where it was before the pandemic? I'm not sure it's ever going to be quite the same between the blow to theater and restaurants, between the far larger number of employers who are going to have people working at home between the risks people are going to attach to the subway uh, system. I think New York will be a great city, but maybe not with quite the same sense of dense energy that it had before. So I'm not sure we're going to see any time in the foreseeable future a return to life as it was. Okay, not as happy a note, but thank you so much. That is Summers says from the man himself, our special contributor, Larry Summers of Harvard. Thank you so much. Finally, one more thought. What if a $300 million tree fell in the forest and no one was there to see it? That's more or less what happened when the pandemic and the shutdowns hit New York City and the 20,000 street vendors who sold us coffee and hot dogs and pretzels on the street every single day lost 90% of their business. And we weren't there to see it because most of us had fled our offices in the city. But it turns out someone did notice. When the bankers at Morgan Stanley's Times Square headquarters started working from home, they asked what had become of the vendors they used to buy from every day. And so the Morgan Stanley Foundation is working with the Robin Hood Foundation to distribute over $2 million to these vendors in need, people who weren't eligible for the trillions of dollars in stimulus, people who simply fell between the cracks. 26% of all the vendors didn't receive any cash assistance because of their migration status or lack of documentation. And so that's why this initiative uh, could not have been more important, but in many ways, it really could not have been more timely. So as Washington continues to debate the merits of state assistance and liability limitations, it may be good to remember those who have been part of our lives and we very much hope will be again and do what Americans have always done best, donate to the charities called on to fill in the gaps in our system. We need them now more than ever. That does it for this episode of Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. This is Bloomberg. See you next week.